Jessica Petiti, she's got the Bachelor's of Science in Biology and Doctorate of Physical Therapy from The Ohio State University. She works as a physical therapist and rehabilitation supervisor for Ohio Health Neurologic Rehabilitation in Delaware, Ohio. She focuses in neurologic physical therapy with a particular interest in neurodegenerative diseases. She instructs the Ohio Health MS wellness program at the Delaware YMCA and serves as a self-help group leader for the National MS Society Delaware MS Connections Group. Let's welcome Jessica. So this is for you, and that's the monitor and the, and the, and the timer, okay? And then you just click right or left. And you're good. Exactly. good, thank you. All righty, thank you. All righty, can everyone hear me okay? Okay, very good. So I want to start off by thanking everyone for investing the time and energy to be here today to learn and improve your wellness while living with MS. So I want to start with what does wellness mean? And there's two main definitions that kind of float around regarding wellness. One of those being a more personal definition and one that's more focused. I'm sure they know, <laughs> from a health systems approach. So from a personal aspect, wellness is defined as a quality or state of being and healthy in both body and mind as a result of deliberate effort. And we're gonna really focus on the deliberate, deliberate effort aspect of this today. From a healthcare approach, it emphasizes preventing illness and disease as opposed to just treating the disease. So from healthcare, we don't want to see you just when you're sick. We want to have an ongoing relationship with you to make sure we can keep you as well as possible. There's many dimensions of wellness, and today we're going to take a particular focus on physical wellness, and then secondarily, emotional wellness. The start of the presentation on how to improve physical wellness in MS, I feel like we do have to talk about some of the symptoms in MS that make wellness challenging. When I work with individuals in physical therapy or in my wellness program, or even when I'm working with individuals as the self-help group leader, there's a lot of symptoms people talk about that are particularly troublesome when trying to achieve a more active and healthy lifestyle. Numbness or tingling or weird sensations in your legs can make it challenging to exercise. As a result of cognitive issues or depression related to MS, it can make it challenging to just initiate getting going with exercise. Fatigue, muscle spasms, weakness, or walking difficulty can make it hard to exercise because it can be hard to go about your day-to-day -day lives to start with. Karina touched on some of the bowel or bladder problems, and if you're going to the bathroom every 30 minutes, it could be near impossible to even get in 20 minute exercise in if you're gonna to need to go to the bathroom that often. And pain is another commonly reported symptom. And if you're in pain, people might be afraid to exercise or say, it just hurts and I'm not gonna move. But today we're gonna to work on overcoming some of those barriers and making an exercise plan. I wanna start by just kind of taking a poll of the audience of who here exercises? Good amount of hands, but I see we still have some work to do. So for those of you that are exercising, we're hoping today we can enhance your program. And for those of you that are not exercising, we're hoping that we can give you some good ideas to help get started. So when we look at physical wellness from a high level perspective, the exercise portion is what we're gonna particularly focus on today. But also, in addition to exercise, we need to make sure we're giving our body adequate rest. In addition to sleep, that means taking the breaks that you need to during the day and listening to what your body's telling you. If you're so tired you can't even stand up, we need to make a new plan because you're not gonna be able to exercise effectively. Having a well-balanced diet and eating healthy can help you give you better energy and help you feel better. As many of you know, smoking can be very detrimental to the progression of MS and smoke, not smoking is very important for your health. Having an annual physical exam and following up with your MS provider as instructed can help make sure you're optimizing your physical wellness. Stress management also has important implications to both physical wellness and emotional wellness, and we're gonna discuss some stress management later in the discussion. So I want you guys to think of exercise as a way to thrive with MS. 
So there's been a lot of research done in regards to exercising with MS, and it's shown they have a lot of great benefits. One of those is having better endurance, meaning you can go through and do the things that you need to do throughout your day with a little more ease. It can help build up strength so you can do things like stand up, walk around, or get up and down the stairs a little easier. It can help improve our mood and attitude and overall give us a better quality of a life, which is pretty awesome. It can also help decrease our fatigue. Fatigue is an often disabling symptom of MS, and something as simple as exercise can give us more energy. And I know it sounds confusing, because you're like, hey, I probably have to spend energy to exercise. How is this going to make me feel better? And we're going to discuss that later. We do know that, unfortunately, individuals who have MS have lower bone density, but the good news is that exercise, and even Dr. Eubank focused on some vitamin D information, can help boost your bone health to help make sure your bones are as strong as possible and can help assist in fracture prevention. Karina touched earlier on how exercise can help improve your bowel and bladder function, which can have really important implications on your day-to-day -day life. Many Americans, including those both with and without MS, want to manage their weight better, and exercise can be a great way to do so. Memory and cognition impairments are often another disabling symptom of MS, but the good news is exercise can help with all of these things. So you're probably like, hey, this all sounds great and all, but this is too much research. How can this actually impact my day-to-day -day life? So what I did is I took a few patient stories from the few the past couple months of people telling me how, when they started exercising, their lives got better. And this is the stuff that's really important to you guys. So one individual has family and friends that live in Cincinnati, and she wanted to be able to drive to Cincinnati, spend lunch or dinner with them, and drive home. Well, unfortunately, at her current state, she was needing to get off the highway and take three to four rest breaks in order to make the return trip home. After participating in her new exercise program for about six weeks, she was able to complete the entire trip without rust breaks, which was huge for her. I have another individual who was a new grandma, and her goal was to be able to care for her grandchild. She worked really hard at exercising for three months, and then her, the grandchild was born, and she now serves as the full-time caregiver for that grandchild. And prior to that, she was so fatigued, it was challenging to even go get bread from the grocery store. I've had some individuals that have fallen so in love with cycling and exercise that they're trying to participate in Bike MS this year and raise even more funds for MS awareness because they're doing so well with their exercise. I had someone come in about two months ago that said, I cannot get off the toilet. It takes me five tries, it's frustrating, it's embarrassing, and it's just taking so much effort to get off the toilet. As a result of participating in about a month of exercise, she is now able to get off the toilet on the very first try, which is a very big deal. I have another individual who, for the past five years, she's had to stand up the shower because she simply did not have the leg strength to get in and out of the bathtub. She got on a good exercise program for about six weeks and is now back to her regular baths, which was a really important quality of life aspect for her. Other individuals will report, you know, I used to go up the stairs and I'd trip every time, but now that I've started exercising, I'm almost never tripping. And for many individuals who may live in a two-story home or have stairs at work or in their day-to-day -day life, this can have really important implications. So exercise probably sounds absolutely fantastic right now, and it is. But I do want to emphasize that exercise is intended to complement but not replace your disease-modifying therapy. And if you have any questions regarding any of the medications you're on or your prognosis, please make sure you're discussing this with your MS provider. So now I'm saying, okay, exercise is great, but now you're like, okay, what do I do? And that can be really confusing and scary. So we're gonna go over some basic tips to help get you started. And we're gonna have a talk later today that's gonna go e into even more detail about the stretching and strengthening aspects. So for starting out with exercise, you should begin at a low to moderate intensity. 
What that means is it shouldn't be so easy that you're carrying on the conversation with someone, perhaps how you will during lunch or coffee. It needs to be higher intensity than that, but you also shouldn't be like that athlete that you see on TV after they've done a rigorous race that is bent over and can't even get one word out to talk to the reporter. You're trying to aim for somewhere in the middle where you can carry out a light conversation, but you still feel like you're challenging yourself. It's very important to listen to your body and to not overdo it. Our goal is for you to have a healthy relationship with exercise, and it's not something that you're doing right before your next MS visit, because you know your provider's gonna ask you that if you've been exercising, and you don't wanna lie, so you start exercising two weeks before. We don't want that. We want you to build a long-term and healthy relationship with exercise. As well, we don't want you tired one to two days after exercising. If you're in that standpoint exercising, you're doing too much or we need to tweak how you're approaching exercise. Exercise is intended to give you more energy overall, not make you feel worse. Taking rest breaks can be another way to help you tolerate exercise better. For example, with strengthening exercises, the research recommends starting with one to three sets of strengthening exercises of eight to 15 repetitions. So one example of how this may look is you could do a set of squatting exercises. And after you're finished, depending on how you're feeling, you can either stand or sit and do an arm-based exercise. From there, you can take another short break and perhaps go to a side lunge, which is gonna work more of the side muscles of your hip instead of the muscles in the front and backs of your legs. By taking these short little rest breaks during exercise, people find that they're, allowed, they're able to accomplish a lot more and feel much, much better. My goal for exercise isn't for you to keep going until you can't move on to another rep, it's for you to feel good afterwards. Another way this can be achieved is by spacing exercise throughout the day or during the times of day that you have the most energy. Waiting till the end of the day when you, it's 9 or 10 p.m. and you're absolutely exhausted often isn't a good way to set yourself up for success. However, if you plan perhaps 15 minutes in the morning and 15 minutes in the afternoon, you might find that you can achieve your exercise goals much better. Next, we're gonna discuss endurance exercise or cardiovascular exercise, which is intended to get your heart rate up. We recommend doing this kind of exercise two to three days a week and working anywhere between 10 to 40 minutes. If you're someone who's new to exercise, even starting with as little as five minutes can make a difference. I tell many individuals that it might take you six months to one year to get up to that 30 to 40 range, minute range. And I like to use, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day. You don't need to get to where these guidelines are immediately, but it's a good long-term goal to get to. Some examples of aerobic exercise you can do are walking, utilizing a stationary bike, or even doing water aerobics. For those of you who may have some difficulty walking around, I do caution utilizing walking as your only form of aerobic exercise if your leg's getting tired before you feel like your heart rate's getting up. This exercise should be boosting your heart rate, and if it's not, we might have to look to a different method of exercise for you. There's gonna be more detail on flexibility and stretching in a later presentation, but we did wanna discuss that stretching should be done daily, and it should involve especially the muscles that are spastic and stiff. When you're stretching, you don't wanna be doing fast movements, because that can make your spasticity worse, but doing a, low, slong, a long, slow, and gradual stretch for about 30 to 60 seconds per muscle group. In regards to balance, many individuals with MS experience balance impairments. And I like to tell people, if you don't use it, you can lose it in regards to balance practice. It's important to challenge yourself, but also safety is your number one priority with these. Who in the audience likes to do balance exercises? Actually more than I've ever seen before. So, in my clinical experience, I've had zero people who have liked doing their balance exercises. So what I like to tell people is, if you have a habit that you go to every day, so 
For example, if you're Dr. Boster, we know he drinks coffee a lot of times a day, so he's probably near a coffee pot frequently. If you know that's something that you're gonna do and wait for your coffee, you can do your balance exercises then. Or we should all be brushing our teeth at least twice a day, hopefully. So in that instance, you could do your balance exercises either before, during, or after brushing your teeth, and really trying to incorporate balance into your daily activities and as a habit as part of your daily life. Next, we're gonna go into a little more detail of some of those barriers that we discussed earlier. So fatigue can definitely be a barrier to exercise, and that kind of goes hand in hand of finding the time when you are tired. Some individuals will come to me and say, you know, I tried the exercise, I went to this group fitness class, and I just couldn't keep up. I really wanted to do it, but they kept going, and I just felt worn down 20 minutes into the class. Some people might not be sure how to safely exercise. They go, okay, I feel really off balance, my legs kinda hurt, they feel tingly, this leg's stiff. Is it even safe to exercise, or how should I do so safely? Some individuals may have pain and think the same things. You know, am I gonna do myself more harm with exercise? Or how do I adjust the exercises because of my pain? Other individuals may start out exercising and think, oh, this is going well, but after a week or two, they kind of fade off because they haven't found the best way to incorporate it into their daily routine. So next, we're gonna discuss how to overcome some of these barriers. We're gonna go into more detail for each of these, but they include setting yourself up for success, finding the right program for you, understanding the role of fair therapy and fatigue management, and being aware of what community-based programs that, out there, that are out there that support you. So in regards to setting yourself up to, for success, we're gonna work for, further on making some appropriate goals today. Having a buddy, whether it be another friend who has MS or maybe they don't have MS, a family member, even a dog can be great ways to keep yourself on track. Also keeping track via a diary or I like to tell people print off a calendar, write down your exercise plan for a month. This plan should be written down like when you're taking your medications or you're taking or you're attending a medical appointment. It's not something that can be rescheduled and it's not something that can be missed. And then after a month, you can really look back and reflect like, oh, every Tuesday I'm missing. Maybe I need to reset my exercise schedule to set myself up for success. Starting in small bouts of exercise and gradually working your way up can be good ways to help you stick with it. I don't want anyone going out there exercising for the first time, trying to do 40 minutes without stopping. You'll start hating exercise. And that moves on to the next point of, we want you to have fun. Exercise should be something you enjoy and that you build a positive relationship with. So in regards to goal setting, we want you to think about making SMART goals. And we say SMART goals so you can set yourself up for success. These should be specific, meaning you don't wanna just, saying I wanna get fit isn't very specific, but I wanna be able to walk this far. Or think about those other examples we discussed earlier. Do you wanna be able to get on and off the toilet? Do you wanna be able to walk a certain distance? What are you really trying to achieve? They should be measurable. So if you're saying, I wanna walk, well, how far do you wanna walk? Is it to the mailbox, the quarter mile around the block, or perhaps another distance? They should be something that's achievable. So if you're not a runner saying, I'm gonna go out and run a marathon or climb out Mount Everest, this probably isn't a very achievable goal. They should be relevant to your day-to-day -day life. So this should, should be something that you're wanting to improve upon. And it should be time-based. I like to tell people you should have both a short-term goal, which is about two to four weeks, and a long-term goal, which is something that you're trying to achieve in about six months to a year. And this is to help keep you on track, but also look ahead at moving forward. Some examples of what an appropriate goal could be is in one month, I'm gonna walk my dog around the block, which is one quarter mile, three times a week. An example of an unrealistic goal is in one month, I'm gonna run a half marathon, or in one month, I'm gonna exercise for an hour a day each and every day. This simply is not setting yourself up for success. 
If you're having any trouble overcoming your barriers to exercise, whether it be pain, spasticity, balance, or weakness, this is where a therapist, either a physical therapist or occupational therapist who focuses in neurologic care can come in and help you achieve your goals. It's important to remember that our goal is to set you off on your own to an independent program, whether that be something you do at the gym, in your home, with a personal trainer, or through a community supported program. We are always here to help you and assist you, and many individuals will come back to see me over time, but ultimately our goal is for you to not need us. Next we're going to discuss the big fatigue standpoint. So there are kind of two main types of fatigue with MS. There's the fatigue that's more centralized or related to the MS disease process, and there's the secondary fatigue, which can occur when you don't move around as much. So if you take someone who doesn't exercise, they're not gonna be as in good of shape as they used to be. As they don't move around as much as they used to, they can get weaker, and this sedentary lifestyle, deconditioning, and weakness can contribute to further fatigue, and this cycle can go on and on. However, we can break or reverse this cycle through exercise. So if you start exercising, you can get in better shape, you can get stronger, and as a result, you can have less fatigue. In regards to finding a program that works with, for you, there's no best kind of exercise that's found in the research for MS. The best kind is the one that you enjoy and that you're gonna stick with. Ideally, all programs should include some aspects of cardiovascular exercise, strengthening, balance, and stretching, but ultimately, it's for you to decide what you like the best. This can take some trial and error. So if you try a few forms of exercise and went, I hate everything, it's not an excuse to give up. We just have to find the right thing that's gonna work for you. There are many wellness programs in the community that you can connect with to help support your healthy lifestyle. Yoga on High in Columbus has an MS-specific yoga program. The Adaptive Sports Coalition additionally has adaptive programs for both cycling, skiing, and canoeing. In regards to social and emotional wellness, Ohio Health through the Dempsey Center has programs such as art therapy, music therapy, and neuro yoga. We, offer, we additionally offer some MS-specific exercise programs. There's a few different programs that are located throughout the city and also north of the city, and these can help you stick to your exercise program and really learn how to exercise as well. Some are structured in more of a 12-week program, whereas others occur on a rolling basis that best meet your personal needs. In regards to social and emotional wellness, there's an array of support groups out there who can, that can help connect you with others who understand what it means when you're like, my leg's really tired and I need to figure out how to exercise, or what it means to have to modify your lifestyle. There's support groups that are through the Ohio Health Dempsey Center, and for those of you who aren't in the central Columbus area, the National MS Society has support groups that run nationwide. For those of you who think your needs might be better addressed on a one-on-one -on -one basis, counseling is a great option to look at, and your MS provider can help you connect you with the right person for you. In regards to social wellness, many of the same aspects of physical wellness apply. So you should be setting yourself up for success. Similar to how I don't want you to do 15 exercises until you can't move anymore, I don't want you attending 15 social events until you're so tired you cannot drive yourself home. This is where, similar to exercise, making a plan and sticking to it can be very crucial. And this can take some open and honest conversations with family members and friends. Sometimes it can be helpful to write down a list of priorities of the things that are most important to you, and then being okay to saying no to the things that aren't a priority. In addition, there's many things that can help with stress management to help you from a social wellness aspect. Mindfulness training, such as body awareness or breath awareness with programs such as meditation or progressive muscle relaxation and yoga have been shown to improve quality of life, depression, and fatigue. 
So even doing something like taking a few minutes to yourself every day to work on breathing can make you less tired. So something that can be very simple to do can have a huge impact on your life. So next we're gonna talk about, okay, we've talked about all these things, what do I do to move forward? So when you're starting to make your wellness plan, starting with about one to two items to work on can be a good way to set yourself up for success. Working on 10 or more things at once can be confusing and overwhelming. You wanna write, have a written plan and reassess it over time, which is where the calendar can help. If you are successful, that's excellent. Keep moving, keep growing, you're on the right track. If you weren't, really take time to reflect on what were the barriers and if you weren't successful, ask for help. There's an array of support system out there who can help you be successful, and as it is our goal for you to build success. So I want everyone to start right now, and I know half of you are eating salads and lunch, but <laughs> if you wanna pull out your phones or even have a brief discussion with your table and come up with one or two action items that you're gonna leave with today to improve either your social or emotional wellness, your goals should be smart, meaning specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-based. And I'll give you guys a couple minutes to work on those. And if anyone raises their hand, I can be around for questions. Probably no one's gonna ask questions because everyone's eating, so that's okay. <laughs> okay, so you, for those of you at home, you can, can continue to work on your personal wellness plan. We're gonna give you another minute or so to work on it, writing down two goals that you'd like to start with. All righty. Can I have one person maybe stand up and share a goal that they're willing to share with the audience? Okay, so I'm gonna repeat it to everyone. So this individual said, you know, I have my exercise plan. I know how often I should be doing it. But really my failure happens in my ability to set myself up for success. So what she's going to do is something as simple as putting her exercise band in her purse so then she can do her exercise two to three times a week. So I'm going to end with my mountain analogy. And for those of you who are hikers or maybe not, you may not or may not be able to appreciate this. But you, if you look at a mountain from far away, it appears that it's a straight up journey to the mountain. But if you've ever hiked, you may realize that parts of the mountain may be a steeper hill or parts of your wellness journey that can be particularly challenging to climb up. Other parts might be a little more level and you're thinking, wow, wellness is going well right now. Or also, at some points, it might seem like you're going downhill a little. But as long as you're continuing to work on your wellness and work on moving forward, you're still getting towards the top of the mountain, which is really your achievable and goal of wellness. Thank you. That was good, but I wasn't ready for that. All right. Next, we have urologist, Dr. Kettle Shaw. And Kettle Shaw completed urology residency at the Ohio State University Medical Center. Must be very popular around here to go to Ohio State University. Great. All right. Then he completed a fellowship training in pelvic, in female pelvic medicine and reconstruction from University of Colorado, Denver. He previously worked as assistant professor in urology at the Ohio State University Medical Center, where he started a multiple sclerosis clinic and worked closely with the MS group. He has continued his commitment to care for MS patients since transitioning to uh, Ohio Health. He's enjoyed working with MS patients and helps them with urologic issues and improve their quality of life. So let's all welcome Dr. Shaw. Thank you. The presenter is right here. Okay, great, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Stuart. I'd like to thank all of you for coming here and uh, attending this seminar. Um, there are a lot of uh, faces which I recognize here, and that actually make me feel great that you are all here. I also want to thank Dr. Boster, Dr. Nicholas, and Dr. Eubank, uh, who I partner 
for a long time now and really enjoy taking care of their patients. So I'm here to talk about how a urologist can be a part and an important part of your management and your well-being. So I have no disclaimer for this talk. Uh, let's talk about how the bladder works first before we start talking about bladder dysfunction. So you all are aware that our bladder is almost like, the way I think about it, it's like a balloon. It can stretch, it's elastic. So while we are all sitting here and having our lunch and drinking tea, water, the bladder gets full and it keeps sending signal to our brain that let's go and pee. But the brain says, well, Dr. Shai is giving a lecture, why we can't pee right now, correct? <laughs> so say, okay, sure, we'll keep filling. And that continues till the bladder says, well, I think I just can't hold anymore. So that's where you have your normal bladder filling, which is approximately about 300 to 500 cc, depending on how different patients are. At that point, say, okay, well, I'm gonna go, I don't care, all right? So you go to the bathroom, you relax, your bladder muscles contract, your sphincter relaxes, and we pee. So that's a process that happens depending on your fluid intake anywhere from five to seven times during the day, maybe zero to one times at night time, correct? So that is normal bladder function. Now, in those patients who have some form of neurological conditions, whether it's a multiple sclerosis, stroke, Parkinson's disease, etc these normal bladder function gets disrupted, and that is what we call a neurogenic bladder. So we'll be talking a little bit about how neurogenic bladder manifests and what we can do to help your symptoms. Now, before we go ahead, why a urologist is important in your care? So this was a very nice study which was done in the International Journal of MS uh, in 2015. So they did a survey and more than 1,000 patients actually participated. So there were a lot of questionnaires asking about your symptoms, what different things patients do, management, et cetera. So the important thing here is to look at more than 90% of the patients who responded to this survey say that they had one or different form of bladder dysfunction, and which is a very important number. That tells us that in a patient with MS, as time goes on, Bladder function is going to be an important part of your thing, and then you are likely to need help from a urologist at some point. The most common things that we talk about is urinary incontinence, dribbling, and sometimes difficulty in emptying bladder. So this is, tells us that how common this problem is to see a urologic issue in patients with MS. Now, these are three or four common reasons why patients are referred to our practice. The most common is obviously bladder dysfunction, and we'll talk definitely in detail about this. The other two issues are also important, recurrent urinary infections and sexual dysfunction. A lot of time, these things don't get addressed in timely manner, but they definitely affect the quality of life, and we should address them. So, when we talk about bladder dysfunction, there are mainly two varieties that we need to talk about. First and foremost is what is called the storage dysfunction. Now I'm sure you have seen these phrases, and these are phrases from my patients. They come and tell me that I got to go now, or I go all the time. Also, a lot of time they say like, I have this constant urge to pee, even I have just passed urine. Sometimes patients say that I'm up awake all night long. A lot of time they say like, I leak out before I make it to the bathroom, and last, and this is kind of my favorite one, and they say like, I know each and every restroom in this city. And I'm sure a lot of you have told me that. So this is essentially the problem with storage function. Now as urologists, we have given a, a very fancy name to this. We call it an overactive bladder, correct? So as I mentioned in normal bladder function, if somebody is passing urine more than eight times during daytime, that's considered to be more than normal. If you're getting up more than twice, that's considered to be a nocturia. And in those patients who have these symptoms of urgency where they cannot stop and they have to go to the bathroom or in, end up having an urge incontinence, so this constellation of symptoms is called as an overactive bladder. Now, contrary to this, there is another class of patients who come with difficulty in passing urine. So these are patients who have emptying dysfunction. So common words that we hear from them is that I have trouble start urinating. 
They describe as that I go to bathroom, I sit down, I wait 30 seconds, a minute, sometimes two or three minutes before I can actually start going. Sometimes I have to push on my belly to pee or empty. Sometimes I feel that I have passed urine, but I just do not empty well. And a lot of time in extreme cases come, they are in complete retention. So these are the common symptoms that patients present with emptying dysfunction. Now, MS is kind of an interesting disease that as the MS progresses, or if you go through a relapse or a flare up of your disease, then your symptoms from storage to emptying or emptying to storage will actually keep changing. So a number of patients, by the time they come to us, they actually have mixed dysfunction. So they have some symptoms, some symptoms of storage, some symptoms of emptying. So that's why it's very important that you follow with your urologist on a regular basis. Now, what do you expect when you come to our office? Just like any other disease, history is the most important part. We would go in absolute detail about what kind of bladder dysfunction are we talking about. Again, it's storage, emptying, mix. How much of, especially in terms of incontinence, what is the magnitude? We are talking about just small volume leakage, or we are talking about complete incontinence. How much this interferes with your quality of life? This is a very important thing. A lot of time our patients would say, well, the symptoms are so bad that I have stopped going to all the social events. I don't go to church, I don't meet my friends, I'm very depressed. And I'm sure a few of you have told me, and that is really, really kind of important things for us. The other thing we want to know that, what prior treatment have you received? A lot of time when you tell these symptoms to your primary doctor or even your neurologist, they will actually start you on some medication. So it's important for us to know what all the different things you have tried. If you had any prior surgical procedures, those are important as well. Finally, what's your goal with the therapy? That is most important, whether you are looking to be completely continent, whether you want to make sure that you are able to achieve a good quality of life and do different things that you want to do. And again, social support is very important because a lot of patients who are, you are here with your family and friends, which tells us that you have a very good support system. Some patients who are not so fortunate have difficult times and we tailor our treatment based on their social support we have. We always like to use questionnaires, and this is one of those questionnaires that I'm sure you have filled it when you first time go and see your neurologist. So this questionnaire has some parts of uh, uh, questions related to your bladder as well as your bowel dysfunction. In our office, we, ask, we like to use a voiding diary. We usually will give you a three to five days voiding diary, which will give us some insight into your actual day-to-day -day life. In our office, we'll also do some basic urine test, bladder scan, and even ultrasound if required. Now, a select group of patients who have really complex voiding dysfunction will actually undergo some advanced testing. And some of you may already remember this or have done this already. It's called a urodynamic test. Now, when you go to your MS doc, they will basically get your MRI every six months or a year. This is our MRI. This is where we actually want to study your bladder. We exactly want to find out how is your bladder dysfunction, whether it's a storage function, emptying function, or is it a mixed one? It's an extremely simple test. I want to tell you a few things about this test because patients really get stressed when we tell them about this test. This test involves putting a very small catheter in the bladder. Then we will just slowly fill up the bladder as it gets filled up when you drink water. And then and we ask you to do various maneuvers like coughing and see how much you can hold. And when the patient's bladder is completely full, we just allow them to pass urine on the machine and see if the bladder muscles and the sphincter are working as a common unit. So it takes about 10, 15 minutes. It's not painful. It doesn't have any complications or side effects, but it gives us a great amount of information that helps me make the best judgment for diagnosis. Now, let's talk about how do we manage these problems. We're going to talk about first those patients who come to me with bladder emptying. So patients who are in retention, patients who say, well, I can't completely empty my bladder, or they have high residual urine. First and foremost is education. We try to educate them exactly what is the reason why these symptoms are happening. Second important thing is time voiding and double voiding. This is what we call as bladder training or bladder retraining. Now, double voiding is an important thing and that we tell a lot of MS patients to do. 
This is very, very simple. First of all, when the patient is in the bathroom peeing, and when they are done peeing, we ask them to stay for a few extra seconds to minutes. We ask them to get up, wipe themselves. That actually can start another reflex of micturation, and they can sit down again and, gay and pee again second time. So they would be spending more time in the bathroom with the hope that they can empty their bladder more, and it definitely works well. Some patients, especially in women, they can actually press on their lower abdomen in the pelvic area and press. That's called Valsalva maneuver, and that can help to pass urine as well. Selected cases based on the urodynamic findings, we can offer them medications like alpha blockers, for example, like Flomax, other medications like Bethanacol. These can be given. Results are not the best, but certainly these are the only options we have if the patients have trouble emptying their bladder. The mainstay of management in patients who cannot empty is actually CIC. CIC stands for clean intermittent catheterization. So who can perform CIC? Anybody can perform CIC. As long as the patient has dexterity in their upper extremity and they have body habitus that allows them to do CIC. Obviously, they should be motivated and they should have good social support. They can do it. At what age can we do CIC? Any age, we can do CIC. Anywhere from young kids to any elderly patients can do CIC. And more importantly, who, should, who can do CIC? The best, if the patient himself or herself can do CIC, is the best. If they cannot, for some reason, then a caregiver can perform, whether it's a spouse or a close friend, or even sometimes nursing staff can do the same thing for them. The main advantage of CIC, in my opinion, is that this makes you really independent of your bladder care. You are not dependent on catheters. You are not dependent on anybody else managing your bladder, but it's you who are in charge. And second, second important thing, these patients can be sexually active because they do not have a catheter coming through the urethra. Some other things about CIC. How often should we do? Well, it all depends upon how much fluid intake you have. But we truly expect you to do about every four to six hours. Uh, there are different types of catheters, and I have put some pictures here. The catheters could be a straight catheter, or it could be a bench or a CUDE catheter, especially helpful in men with enlarged prostate. There are different kinds of catheters. Most of these catheters are basically use and throw. And on your insurance will definitely give you catheters which will be use and throw, because they have value in re uh, reducing the amount of recurrent urinary infections, which is very important. Some of the problems that we see with uh, catheters is that it can lead to recurrent urinary infections, pain, bleeding, etc. So we deal with those complications depending on how it happens. Now those patients who are unable to perform catheterization, or they have tried but it does not work, or they have urethral stricture disease, in those cases we do Foley catheters. Now, I'm not at all a big fan of these catheters because they have lots and lots of problems like causing infections, bleeding, urethral injury. But if there is no other options, then catheterization is probably the next best thing to go for. Now, let's talk about those patients who have difficulty in storing urine. So these are the patients who go to bathroom frequently, lots of urgency, and lots of accidents. First and foremost, we talk about behavioral modification, and this is very important, time voiding or bladder retraining. In the previous talk, we just we heard that these patients have difficulty in walking. It is very difficult by the time they get urged to go to bathroom. It sometimes takes 30, 30 seconds, a minute, or two or three minutes before you can actually make it to the bathroom. So if you time yourself, if you time yourself every two hours, every one and a half hours, then you are going to stay ahead of your bladder and you're going to be able to make it to the bathroom in good time. So that's why time voiding, time voiding is extremely important. The other thing is diet. You know, a lot of patients have habit of drinking lots of tea, coffee, sodas. We tell them to do that, but just in moderation. Decrease the amount of these beverages which are very high in um, caffeine. Um, that can certainly be very helpful. Patients who have a lot of nocturia, they get up several times at night, we tell them to slow down their fluid intake about two hours before they're ready to go to bed, and that helps a lot too. Now the mainstay of treatment for these patients with overactive bladder is actually medications. Some of you are already on these medications, and some of you have already tried in the past. So 
The most common medication that we use today, these are a class of drugs called anticholinergics. They work on a very specific receptor on our bladder called the muscarinic receptors. But these receptors are also present in different parts of our body. So these drugs are useful, but they have a lot of side effects. The common side effects are dry mouth, constipation, and sometimes even things like delusion, hallucinations, things like that. This is a big chart. This talks about six different medications in this class which are available in the market today. Uh, depending on your preference, depending on your insurance coverage, the urologist will try different medications. There are different doses available, so there would be some titration will be required depending on how you respond to these drugs. Another drug which has been used in last about six to seven years is called Miribetric. This is a new drug which works on a different set of receptors. So if you have already tried the first group of medications, you did not like it or it did not work for you, then this would be your second line. This medication is pretty good. Sometimes we have trouble getting uh, authorization from your insurance because it's still not generic at this point, but it's a pretty good drug. Now, I'd like to talk about a different group of patients, what we call them a refractory overactive bladder. So these are the patients who have tried behavioral therapy, they have tried time voiding, they have tried at least two medications from the group we just talked about, and they continue to have symptoms. So they are officially labeled as refractory overactive bladder. And this group of patients, we have what we describe as third line therapy, and which includes Botox, a neuro pacemaker, and an acupuncture treatment. So we'll talk about these, and this is very important part of the treatment now. Uh, bladder Botox. Now, can you guys tell me how many of you are doing Botox in the extremity or in the limb? I see a few hands here, and I know a few of you have done Botox in the bladder as well. So some of you are aware that Botox is a very, very strong neurotoxin. It can affect the release of a specific neurotransmitter from the nerves, which can help to reduce the spasticity of a specific muscle. In this case, we are trying to reduce the spasticity of the bladder muscles. How it is done? It's a very simple procedure. It can be done in the office when the patient is awake under using a local anesthetic, or those patients who have pain issues, we certainly do it in the OR. Uh, there are two doses we use, 100 units and 200 units, that depending on patient's symptoms, and whether the patient has responded to 100 units and then we would go to 200 units. There are a couple side effects that we should talk about. One is these patients have a little bit higher risk of developing urinary infections or bladder infection. So if you already have a lot of UTIs, then we are a little careful before we suggesting Botox to you. And second important thing is that there is a very small risk of patients developing what is called retention where they can't empty their bladder completely. The risk is pretty small, one in 20. That's a pretty small number. But patients should be aware that this certainly can be a possibility. So Botox has really revolutionized the bladder management in patients who have not responded to the medications. Another treatment which is very good is what we call the pacemaker treatment or sacral neuromodulation. This therapy is very promising. We have done in few cases in MS, but the main problem comes along that the current generation of pacemakers or sacral pacemakers are not MRI compatible. So we are unable to get MRI of their spine if they have one of these implants. So we try to keep this as a reserved option in case some of the other options do not work. Another interesting thing that has been done in last about almost seven to eight years is a treatment called percutaneous tibial nerve stimulation, also called as an acupuncture treatment and it is based on acupuncture principle. So the idea here is to use a small acupuncture needle. It is placed just behind the ankle. There is a nerve that we are trying to stimulate. It's called tibial nerve. And if you stimulate that nerve with a small TENS unit in the office for about half an hour, that can actually help to improve your bladder symptoms. So the patients come to our office for a 30-minute treatment every week for 12 weeks. So it's a lot of treatment, lots of visits, but it's a very simple treatment, has no side effects, no complications. Once the patient have improvement in their symptoms, then they would come to our office once a month to continue the therapy. So about 70 to 80% of the patients will feel that, yes, my symptoms are better. 
But again, you have to make several visits to our office. So depending on the schedule, depending on how close you are to the office, that is a, a problem. So a new solution to this problem is under investigation right now. Researchers are looking into an, a small implant that can be placed along this tibial nerve safely in the office, which could be a small implant or it could be a small coin. And the idea is that at home, you will be stimulating this device yourself in the morning, maybe half an hour to an hour, every morning while eating your breakfast or while driving. And that will stimulation will help you to improve your bladder symptom rest of the day. You don't have to come to our office. It's a very minor office procedure that can help. Now, currently, all these implants, I just took liberty to take these pictures from Google so that you can see what's coming up in next few years. These implants will help us to improve your bladder symptoms without going through a major surgery or things like Botox. So and we are hopeful that there is going to be some new things that are coming up in future. Next I want to talk about is recurrent urinary infections. A lot of you suffer from UTIs, and this could be a major reason why patients get hospitalized because of MS. Now, patients with MS, their presentation of UTIs are very different. They typically don't have symptoms of pain, dysuria, burning, but they have symptoms like cloudy urine, foul-smelling urine, just having confusions, sp increased spasticity, more incontinence. So it's important that, it is important to recognize these symptoms of UTIs, and if you experience, call your primary care, call my office, and get your urine checked to make sure you don't have a urinary infection. Now, we see a lot of referral for treatment of UTIs because if they get too many UTIs, then these patients get hospitalized and they have a lot of complications. So when you come to our office, we have two important things that we do. We always want to look at your kidney. We either can do an ultrasound of your kidney or a CAT scan to see for things like stones, any blockage. And we also do a cystoscopy in the office where we can actually look in your bladder to see if you may have be having symptoms of what is called chronic cystitis. And if you truly have a chronic cystitis, then you, will be, then you can get some low dose of antibiotics that can go on for three months, six months, and that can improve your symptoms. So how do we manage UTIs? We talked about uh, some behavioral modification, obviously increasing your fluid intake, make sure you empty your bladder properly, do double voiding. There is certainly a good role for using natural prevention. There's a lot of data out there. A lot of clinical studies has been done talking about natural preventions. Uh, some are good, some are not. Things like cranberry pills, cranberry juice, vitamin C can be helpful to increase the pH of the urine, probiotics can be helpful, d -menos. So there are lots of different supplements that you can use to prevent UTIs. Now some patients, selected patients, depending on the cystoscopy, we would actually recommend them to use a low dose of antibiotic for a long period of time, three months, six months, depending on the situation. Another problem that we see commonly in those patients who are doing self-catheterization. These patients can sometimes have what is called urinary colonization, where the urinary system has bacteria present all the time. So every time you go to somebody's office and they check your urine, they'll say, oh yeah, you got a UTI, but you have no symptoms. So in that case, you do not require antibiotics as long as you don't have symptoms. Those patients who do have a lot of clinical symptoms, there are other options like using a medication called methanamine which is used more as a urinary antiseptic, that can be also very helpful. All right, I'm gonna talk a little bit about <laughs> erectile dysfunction. Uh, again, this is a common problem that we see in our practice. Uh, there are a lot of options for male erectile dysfunction, especially things like drugs, Viagra, Cialis, Levitra. These medications are very helpful. They are expensive, but certainly very helpful. Those patients who are motivated and want to do more, we can certainly help them with vacuum erection device or even penile prosthesis. So these are all options that are available to them. Uh, next, female sexual dysfunction. Another problem which a lot of time gets undiagnosed or underdiagnosed and a lot of patients don't talk about it. But certainly it's present a lot. Depending on the situations, we would send these patients for counseling, sex therapy, if they have a lot of issues with dryness and vaginal pain, then these patients would benefit by using hormone therapy. And some patients who have this typical um, hypoactive sexual dysfunction, 
then they can be used, these medications like uh, flibanserine or testosterone supplementation. So these are all options available to patients depending on their clinical situations. So I'd like to finish my talk here saying that bladder dysfunction is a very important part of patients with multiple sclerosis. These symptoms can really affect the quality of life and things that you like to do. There are a lot of good options available for treatment. I would recommend seeing a urologist, you, um, and that usually becomes a part of your treatment uh, group. Uh, patients who have tried medications and don't have responded well, bladder Botox and acupuncture therapy are really two good options that can be helpful. And last but not the least is recurrent urinary infections should be treated as aggressively as possible because that can prevent a lot of complications. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for your time, and um, we'll take some questions, I guess, later on. Thank you. All right, great. You know, Finally, we've reached the, uh, the, the, the scale where we're now getting towards the end of the program. We have three remaining speakers, but again, I think we really need to give a round of thanks to Ohio Health for supporting us to do today's program. And then also, I wanted to again thank and remind everybody that those seminar evaluation forms we don't just need them for ourselves, we need them to work with Ohio Health on how we can be able to be, between our two, uh, between our organization and their hospital system, how it would be best to be able to provide for you all in the future. So if you can fill that out and put down any recommendations that you might have of things that you want to learn going forward, then we would give it to Dr. Nicholas, Dr. Eubank, Dr. Boster, and the other doctors, the other people that are here today, and it'll give them the opportunity to bring up those subjects with you when they do other events. One organization we did not get to thank today, and they were instrumental in helping us get the word about our program out there, is the National Multiple Sclerosis Society, and I hope that you all give them a round of thanks as well. <laughs> One other thing I have to ask, and that is that the people that are presenting here today cannot speak with you all about things that are going on with yourselves. So please like restrain yourself, and instead make an appointment to go see them, rather than getting them sidetracked with what you may have to speak with them about or things that you may want. So let them just relax after they present because later on we are going to be doing this Q&A. Next, we have Jeffrey Siegel. And Jeffrey Siegel and I have been friends for a very, very long time. In fact, just three months prior to me being diagnosed with MS, Jeffrey was diagnosed with MS. And fortunately for the world, Jeffrey has been out there and able to do a lot of programs with MS Views and News. We are seen, in, he is seen in many archived videos on our YouTube learning channel. Things that you want to learn about what he does and what you could do for yourselves at home with as far as stretch, stretching, listen to me, stretching and strengthening, that's a new combined word, okay? But he can work with you on all of that or you can learn from him from what we have on our archive videos. Jeffrey Siegel is the recipient of the 2007 National Strength and Conditioning Association of Personal Trainer of the Year Award. Jeffrey has written articles for numerous MS publications in addition to others such as Shape Magazine. He's the owner of Balanced Personal Training since 2004. Jeff is also a national motivation and educational speaker. He's a graduate of a distant university from all of you, Florida State University. And he, again, he's a person living with MS since 1998. Let's welcome Jeffrey Siegel. How are you guys doing? You guys enjoying the program so far? Yes. You guys are the Hawkeyes? I know what you guys are. I'm a sports fan. I just figured I'd say that for the people in Iowa who couldn't make it here and are watching. All right, I know a lot of people in here spend a lot more time thinking about exercise than actually exercising. If not, then I'm misled because that's every room. That's not just rooms of people who have MS or rooms of people with any kind of disability or lacking ability. That's what happens with everyone. I mean, the general, if every gym had every person that exercises or everyone that's a member of the gym show up, they're in trouble. There'd be thousands of people in the gym every day and the fire department would have to show up and shut them down. 
What I want to do is I want to give you guys reasons to get past that barrier. I mean, that's the whole thing with exercise. Everybody in this room can exercise. Everybody in this room thinks about exercising at some point, especially today because you've heard a lot of people mention exercise and how well you're going to do with it and what it can do for you. But what if I was to tell you I have a secret plan for you guys to feel better than you do, look better, make more friends, sleep better, um, what else can you do better? I mean, w would you guys want it? Yeah. Okay, so I got 1,440 reasons why you should be doing that, and that's how many minutes there are in a day. So if you take that amount of time and you just take 10 to 30 minutes, like you heard before, out of that time every single day. I'm a believer in exercising every day. It doesn't mean you have to exercise really hard every day, but you got to do a little bit more than you normally would. How many people in here can stand up? Raise your hand. Okay, so there's a few people in here who cannot stand up. That's correct, right? What I ask of you guys, for every person in this room that can stand up, for the people in here who can't stand, I want you to stand up right now. Just stand once, please. And that's not just for the people in this room who are unable to stand. It's for the people who are watching this all over the country and all over the world. So that one stand was one more than you would have done had I not said that. You guys can have a seat. Why can't you do that on your own rather than think about what you should be doing? Anybody in here not go to a gym because of the cost? If you just emptied the change out of your pockets every day, you'd have enough money to join a gym for a month. And it's not that expensive. But you know what is? Being sick. What do you think is more expensive? Going to a gym or getting sick? Because that's one of the other things that exercise can help is uh, immune response and immune function. Ability, not being sick, looking good, feeling good, it seems like a no-brainer, right? That doesn't mean think about it twice as much and then get down on yourself. You know, there's, there was a time I was there where I couldn't stand and, you know, I'm sure a lot of you have experienced that stuff. And I was told that I'd never stand or walk again. And to me, that was like, you know, I, I almost jumped out of my skin because I believed that I could. And believing in yourself is half the battle. If you believe that you can do something, you're 100% more likely to do it. I mean, at least get attempt. But if you don't attempt, you'll never know. And regrets? How many people in here have regrets? We all have some regrets. The biggest regrets in life are the things you don't do. You know, and if you, and if you got an expensive handbag, I would hope that you plan on outliving that handbag. Do you plan on outliving your handbag that you paid whatever for? I hope so. So that's why you should do more. Exercise, follow the recommendations. Some of the things that might stop you is not understanding what you should be doing or the proper form, which is key, because if you do the wrong form, then you can be doing more damage to yourself. So you want to find a professional, physical therapists, um, exercise physiologists, personal trainers who have a background, and you can test them. There's a lot of physical therapists out there that don't know what to do with people with MS. There's lots of personal trainers out there that don't know what they should be doing with general population or anybody, but they have that certificate. So the number, the letters next to somebody's name only mean something if you understand what those letters are. So inquire about it, learn about it. Uh, find yourself a trainer if, if that's what's for you, if you feel you need that little extra push, um, or somebody who understands human movement. The body can only move in certain ways. There's lots of different exercises with different fancy names, but there's not that secret exercise. But I, I can tell you what the most important exercise to do is. You guys were all told there's not, the most, there's not a most important exercise. Do you guys know what the most important exercise is? It's the first one you do. Right? Because if you don't do the first one, there's never going to be a second. You got to start. You have to do that. I mean, it's, you know, the people around you. And how many caregivers do I have in here? If you guys don't exercise, whoever you're caring for, I'm going to allow you to do something harmful to them. I'm, no, I'm kidding. I don't want you to harm them. But if you can't take care of yourself, how are you going to take care of somebody else? I mean, it's, it's an, that's, you know, simple, simple logic. It's just like when you're in the airplane, I'm not going to repeat the whole thing, but you know, the thing comes down, you're supposed to put it in your mouth, then help a person next to you. Because if you don't, you won't be able to help the person next to you. And you don't want to be a caregiver that's getting um, taken care of by the person you're supposed to be caring for because they're exercising and they're doing all the things that they're supposed to be doing. And you're the one who's encouraging them to do it, 
but you're just watching. So be a part of it. In life, participation is key. That's what we want to be. We want to be participants rather than spectators. But right now, you guys are allowed to be spectators. I'm the participant right now. Um, where's Dr. Boster? Is he here? Hey, Dr. Boster. <laughs> Would you mind coming up here a second? Because I want to do a little uh, experiment with you. <laughs> you're the only one in here that doesn't have MS that I know their name. <laughs> Unless you're just secretly a covert MS patient. <laughs> All right, how many people in here, we, we discussed this before, was, have balance problems? How many people in here don't have MS and just want to know, like, what the heck's going on? Come over here. <coughs> okay, what I want you to do is, is it simple. Just stand with your feet touching each other like this. All right. Do you feel as stable as you did before? No. Now look up. Now close your eyes. Do you guys see him swaying? Yeah. Now what if I pushed you? No, I'm kidding. Now try, <laughs> now try one leg. Can you stand on one leg? Oh, I think he does have MS. <laughs> so now, now close your eyes. <laughs> Now, don't do it because then, then you still have a talk to you still have a talk to give. But I just want I want you guys to see he's human. He's really cool and all too, but he's human. And everybody in here who has MS, you're with somebody else and they don't get it entirely. Now you really get it, right? Thanks. I didn't push you down. I appreciate that. Yeah, you know, thank we you. talked about it before, but <laughs> but you see and thank you for coming up because it's really hard to understand what it's like to have MS if you don't have it. It's, as, it's probably more frustrating to not have it and live with someone that has it than actually have it. I can tell you that firsthand. Um, but you really have to push yourself. You have to, get, you have to put your game face on every day. And how many people in here carry a schedule? How many people in here carry a phone? How many people in here's phone doesn't have a schedule? <laughs> How many people in here want to buy a phone? <laughs> um, put exercise in there 10 times a day. All you got to do is one out of 10. If you succeed 10% of that, which is all I ask of you guys, you're accomplishing something that you might not be doing otherwise. Um, same thing with diet. I mean, how many people, diet and exercise go hand in hand. And how many people in here take disease modifying therapy? How many people in here would take disease-modifying therapy if they knew it would work for them 100%? How many people in here would do a little bit more so that when your disease-modifying therapy is stabilizing the way your MS is, you're able to actually do more, not less? Because no matter what you take, no matter how well it works, if you do nothing, that's what you get out of it. You know, if you give medicine to somebody who's laying on their back and they still lay on their back and three months later you're giving them their medicine, how do you know if they're doing better? Their muscles are getting smaller, they're getting weaker, their stamina is decreasing. So being um, sedentary is a problem, not just for people with MS, but exercise for people with MS is the best reason not to be sedentary. It's the best thing to do. I mean, it's, it's pretty simple when you think about it, but you gotta act. I mean, I'm challenging, and I'm not challenging you guys, I'm giving you permission. I give everyone in here permission, A, to feel well. So for the next 10 seconds, if you're hurting, you don't have to hurt. And for the rest of the day and the rest of your life, I'm giving you permission to exercise because exercise doesn't have to be what it was the last time you went to the gym, especially if it was a long time ago. I mean, if I put four or 500 pounds on my back right now in a bar, I would break. <laughs> um, but I don't do that because it's not functional to what I want to do unless I was going to be carrying four or 500 pounds around. And I don't plan on doing that. I mean, especially with my frame, you know. Um, but you got to do it. And how, okay, how many people in here are really keen on keeping your home clean? Okay, who likes going home to a dirty home? Do you guys all like your houses clean? Yes. yes. Do you know what your real home is? It's your body. You get one. If it breaks completely, that's it, end of story. Exercise can prevent all the things that are comorbidities that come along with um, you know, daily life of, of being unhealthy, but all the comorbidities, how do they affect your MS? 
they don't have to affect your MS if it's lifestyle related. Diabetes, heart disease, um, all you know, high triglycerides, blood pressure, you name it. A lot of those things are preventable unless you have a family history. Um, and there's meds and stuff for that, and your doctors can talk to you about those. But how much time would you rather be spending with your doctor about your MS when you're going to an MS appointment than the other illnesses and how they would affect your MS? That's not the way to live. You want to live with everything you got. You want to do as much as you can. How many people in here would just love to do, um, follow their dreams and do it? You know, and without MS being a reason not to. I'm doing that right now. There's somebody who actually told me a couple of days ago, I wish I could do this, and I, and I dreamt of that. And I said, you know what? Uh, I once had a dream that I'd be standing on a stage in front of a large group of people explaining things that you should and shouldn't be doing and helpful stuff and, and not be worried. Coming up on stage, I'm comfortable up here. I bet you half of you would be panicking if you were up here. So I'm not going to call half of you up here. But the rest of you guys, I want, to come, I want you guys coming up. Uh, this weather here, for me, this is awesome. <laughs> I left, it was 85 degrees. I got here and it wasn't. And it's only going to be a couple days, so I'm enjoying this cool weather. But if you live in 85 degrees all year round, it seems like it'd be great, right? But the grass is always green on the other side, isn't it? Um, so that's why I travel, get out of the heat. And then when it's hot out in the summer, I travel and it's still hot. Is it hot here in the summer too? Yes. Come on, if you guys say no, then I'm, then then I really must be in Iowa. <laughs> All right, so the amount of exercise that you do, it's going to change from day to day. I mean, some days you feel better than others. When you're having a good day, that's the day that you should really um, let it all out. Do what you can do. You're going to be able to get a little bit more out of it. The next day is a, a little bit of a slower day. Relax. You can still exercise. And if you were to just raise your hand right now, raise your hand. Now, raise, now put it down, raise the other hand. Now put it down, raise the other hand. All right, we got an aerobics class going, keep going. All right, so you see it's simple. Now, that's another thing you wouldn't have done unless I was standing up here in front of the room and said, hey, can you guys do it? And I hope you guys are doing that at home. I can't see you. So um, I'm, I'm assuming you are because we got a good crowd here and you guys are all doing stuff. How many people in here don't understand exercise whatsoever and just never did it? There's, there might be a few. Because when we were kids, what did we call that? Playing. playing, yes. And you guys can still play. You guys have other things that get in the way of it. But why not be happy? Uh, I want somebody to come up here. I, I, I said it's going to be tough for me to get someone up here because for, for a multitude of reasons. But I want one person, a volunteer. Someone come up, please. I'm going to talk about some stretching and some other things soon. but. I got someone that com that's coming up. Can I have co coffee in my hand? Um, well, you do, so obviously you can. <laughs> okay. So, do you exercise as much as you look like you do? No. Okay. Ah, but you're, you're fooling everybody then. I'll, I'll lie to but you do you. exercise, right? Yeah. What's your biggest issues when you exercise that you'd like to overcome? Maintaining balance and oh. getting over the fear of falling. Okay. So right now you're not balancing. You're stabilized. Balancing is this. Stabilizing is this. So I want everybody to know that. If you can't do this, you got to work on this. And then this can become something like this, and then maybe this. But you know what this is going to do? This is just going to make you show off in front of your doctor, unless you plan on hopping on one leg to the doctor's office. Do you work your core? Sometimes. OK. Core is key. Core is your base. That's like. You know, if you don't have a strong core, everything else isn't going to work properly because you got nothing to keep it, you know, the way it's supposed to go. So I'll show you something simple. Just put your hands like this. Um, just press against my press, press, press that way. Can you feel your core now? Okay, now go this way. I can feel my core. I just really wanted to get a workout. One more time. And there. so then now one arm and let me see your arm. Pull. Do you feel your core? Oh, yeah. Now the other one, just so he doesn't walk in circles. Which side's your stronger side? All uh, right. Yep. Okay. Just making sure. I thought maybe you got tired and left one didn't. Uh, the left one is strong. Both sides are strong, so you can do a lot with both. So when you work out, do you work out regularly or no? Do you want to? Sure. Are you here with somebody? My, myself. 
You're here with yourself? Yeah. Well, if, you, if yourself can't work out, you're not gonna work out. So that's a great thing to do is, um, do, I'm gonna give you something else, a towel. Hold this, do you have a dog? No. No, I think you should get a dog. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay, so if you were to do something with a friend or somebody, or just tie this to something, pull. You feel your core? You're working your legs too? Now pull that way. You feel that? Now pull the other way. All core. The stronger this is, the stronger that's gonna be. So if I were to put this upright and stick arms and legs off of this, and then move the arms and legs, this would do this, right? How would that make your arms and legs function? Not so good. Do you ever get cramps? Mm -hmm. Where? My legs. Uh, what part of your legs? My thighs. In your, like the front side? Mm -hmm. So do you know how to stretch that? I'll just use toe raises. No, 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 no. That's for your calves. Okay, so I just wanted to start off with a stretch because if you have spasticity, cramping, or co-contractions, those are pretty much, um, what happens with spasticity, a co-contraction is when you want to go this way and you also want to go this way at the same time and you get locked. Um, if, you, if you're not sure if you have spasticity in your legs and they're stiff, you don't know if they're weak or spastic, lift your leg into a car and if it stays straight, it's pretty much spasticity, guys. That means your muscles are contracted. So for your quads, a stretch, obviously um, it, you have to have good balance to do it, but if you're holding on to something, that's gonna stretch your quad. Quads usually don't have as much spasticity, for you they do, or, or, um, or cramping, because we sit all the time, right? And when you're sitting, your quads are on stretch. Hamstrings aren't, that's why hamstrings need stretching. So a hamstring, do you know how to do a hamstring stretch? Okay, hamstring stretch would be, do you guys, you guys take PE when you were kids? Do you guys know what PE stands for? All right, because this generation now doesn't. They're like, what? We don't, it's just PE. Um, so, doesn't mean you have to go back to doing the things that you did when you were in PE class, because some of those things were contra are now known as contraindicated movements. But the hurdler stretch, that's what we do to stretch hamstring. What it would look like, I'm not gonna get down on the, um, on the stage because people won't be able to see back there, but imagine I'm laying down and I'm doing this. Remember the hurdler stretch with the foot back like this, and you'd reach down to your foot and touch your toes if you can, and, and you work back here? Well, now it's this way. Now it should be with your leg like that sitting down, it's modified so you don't hurt your knee. If you put your leg back like that, there's too much uh, pressure on your medial collateral uh, ligament and it's caused harm over time. Um, can you grab that for me? All right, ha, he just did a deadlift. <laughs> that was on purpose. All right, can you catch? Don't look at me, look at the ball. I want that, ah. Need help from the crowd, help from the crowd. Come on, someone, get up, quick, run, hurry. Ah, I just want you to get up. We planned that. <laughs> you know what the best thing about exercise? When you throw that, I'm going to throw this. The best thing about it is, well, this can be done against a wall, right? Don't worry, it's coming to me. I have it programmed. <laughs> yeah, I'm having trouble. It's okay, but you know what? No matter how much trouble you're having, I keep seeing a smile. Yeah. So let me see this. Now catch this. Just kidding. Thank you very much for coming up here. So, if you can stand, it's important to stand. If you can't stand, but you can get yourself into a standing position, that doesn't mean you can stand and function standing. It's still really important to have your feet as your ground base of support. That sends signals to your brain, back to your feet, um, may help with proprioception. If you don't know what proprioception is, I'm gonna tell you, I'm not gonna ask if you know it or not, but uh, proprioception is just your body's way of knowing where you are in space. So with MS, you are got some signals that are getting mixed up, they don't make it all the way down, it's like that game of telephone, you guys have heard that, right? Same thing with your brain going down, feeling things coming back up when you're walking, you trip, you stumble more. Um, have, how many people in here want to learn a better way of falling? <laughs> Why would you want to learn how to fall better? You, you should learn how, you've got to learn how not to fall. Don't put yourself in that situation because, you know, eventually you're going to hurt yourself or the ground. But if you do fall, you know this, you can always count on the ground to catch you. 
But fall prevention is important. Standing, sitting, standing, sitting, and then moving laterally. Move. Those types of things are stuff that you don't do. If you do constantly standing and sitting, how many people in here cannot do a squat? Okay, so there's only like four people raising their hands. So everybody else here should be doing squats. Not right now, but when you leave. I would love to come back here and someone, one person tell me, you know what? What you talked about inspired me to do, I don't care if it's one thing, just one thing. So everybody, after today, do one more thing than you normally did to, would have done today, and in addition to your stand that you already did. But if you can stand up out of a chair, you can do a squat. A squat doesn't mean you have to go all the way down to here. It just means you go down as far as you can with still having the ability to stand back up. Uh, and I'm gonna throw this. I was trying to hit someone in the back. Actually, they were gonna catch it. But um, standing, squatting, getting back up, all those things are functional for life. So if you can't go all the way down, just a little bit. And when you stand out of a chair, how many people in here think when you stand out of a chair, you don't have the strength and that's why you might fall back into a chair? Anybody in here try to stand up and you fall back? Do you know what you're lacking? Confidence because you know that chair is behind you. If you did not know that chair is behind you, you'd be more likely to move forward. We need to move forward more. And if you wanna practice stepping laterally, that's also a great thing because um, if you plan on being in the NBA or Major League Baseball, or wrong crowd, uh, that, was supposed to, that was the other room. But if you wanna do stuff that comes up if you, if you trip and you stumble to the side and your glutes aren't strong enough, or your legs aren't um, strong enough to hold you up, you're gonna fall or you're gonna hurt yourself. So practice these things. If these things are stuff that you don't do, do them. I know you guys can all stand up, and they're the ones that can't do stuff seated. There's no one that gets a pass because they can't stand up from exercise. Because I looked around and when I said raise your hands, I saw people who weren't standing raising their hands. And that's a big thing. And if you can raise one hand and not the other one, hold them together and raise them then you're doing more than you would have. But don't, cut, don't sell yourself short on these things. Um, there's so much out there, there's so much information out there. Research it, look into what's best for you, find friends that'll do it with you, hold yourself, it'll hold yourself more accountable when you do it. And look in the mirror and smile, that comes with exercise. And if you're afraid to go to the gym because of the way people are gonna look at you, how many people do that? How many people are worried about how people are gonna perceive the way you are? Who gives a rat something what other people think about you when you're in the gym? Because guess what? They're really not. They don't really care about you. They're in the gym to make themselves feel better and look better and whatever else it is. So, so if you really think they're staring at you, look behind you, there's probably a mirror. Or if they're staring at you, bat your eyes. <laughs> uh, but the thing you wanna do is enjoy it. Do it safely. Find an opportune time to exercise. If you can walk, walk more than you do, as long as you don't um, go too far and can't come back. Uh, know your limits. In exercise, failure is a good thing. That's how we grow. We have something that's called specific adaptations to impose demands. If you do not impose these demands on your body, your body will not respond the way you want it to. We grow, we're still growing. I've got people that are in their 90s that are exercising doing some crazy things that they never did when they were kids and they're loving it. And other people watch them and they see, and I'm at places where other people are supposed to exercise and they say, when can I do that? And I said, when you want to, <laughs> when, when you choose to start. Starting is key. And there's no end point of exercise. There isn't. You keep doing it and doing it and doing it. But if you want the meds that you're taking to work and get the most out of them, if you follow your doctor's advice and you want to get you know, better and feel better and, and work better and everything to be better in life, you gotta do a little bit more. You gotta make sacrifices. So I'm challenging you guys to make some sacrifices. Know what you want and do it, you know, and be willing to give something up if you have to, you know. That change in your pocket might be good for a gym, but don't use that as an excuse. I stole that one from you. Thank you guys so much. I enjoyed watching everyone else speak. And I'll stick around afterwards if you got questions. Thank you. Thank you, Jeffrey. You're welcome. Thank you very much.